Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Norris from Frostburg State University. In this video, we're going to go over the Hoffman elimination. Now, in the course sequence that I teach, I get to the specific reaction called the Hoffman elimination way after I cover E2 reactions in general. And that's, I'm not certain that that's true about every, you know, textbook and course sequence, but that's kind of where we are. So I wanted to just give you a reminder about the E2 elimination reaction. And we're going to talk about some more features of it as we go through this video. But the E2 elimination reaction is a reaction of a alkohalide with a strong base that, that results in, in an alkene. And there are two different regio isomers that have are that could be products here. The Hoffman product, which is the less substituted product, and the Zaitsev product, which is the more substituted product. And when you're using alkoxides and, and some other bases, this react and you're using alkyl halides with the halide leaving group, this reaction is governed by the Zaitsev rule, where with a certain group of bases, that Zaitsev product is uh, the major product because it's the thermodynamically more stable product. But there are a group of bases, like the terp-butoxide base that I've shown here, where the Hoffman product is the major product. And if you're like me, when I learned about this, or when I first started teaching it, you might have wondered why this product was called the Hoffman product when the rule was talking about the Zaitsev rule. So we have these other rules like the Markovnikov rule, where the two products are the Markovnikov product and the anti-Markovnikov product. Why wasn't this Hoffman product called the anti-Zaitsev product? And the reasoning for that is there was already this reaction called the Hoffman reaction which is a way to generate that uh, less substituted alkene, but it starts from a different place. So let's actually look at this Hoffman elimination reaction. I'm going to give you uh, an overview of the reaction sequence, and then we will talk about uh, how it works. I'm going to use uh, a very similar structure here, but I'm going to start with an amine. The Hoffman elimination process starts with an amine, and we need to recognize that this amine functional group is a poor leaving group. And so our first, our first necessity is to make it a better leaving group. And we're going to do that by reacting it with excess iodomethane. And in a previous video, I talk about alkylation of amines and how they're not particularly useful for synthesizing specific amines because each iteration adds another electron donating alkyl group and the, the resultant amine is more nucleophilic and, and, it, and another alkylation is likely. And how if you're not careful, you can get over alkylation to form the quaternary ammonium salt. Well, the desire actually here is to form that quaternary ammonium salt with the iodide counter ion because this thing now, if it acts as a leaving group, acts as a leaving group as a, as a neutral molecule, so it's going to be a good leaving group. Okay. And then we treat it with an appropriate base, and in this particular case, the base that we're going to use is silver oxide. It's actually Ag2O. And we're going to do this in water. Uh, and we'll talk about silver oxide as a base choice here in a moment. Again, I'm going to go through how this all works. And that leads to this alkene as the major product. And the, the Zaitsev alkene probably does form as the minor product. So let's draw it also. So the first thing to know about these first steps here, and these are a sequence of SN2 uh, alkylations, and I'm not going to go over them in any great detail. It's the second step that we need to learn something about. So let's grab this thing. 
Because the first thing that you might have trouble recognizing is you might have trouble recognizing that there is even a base present here at all. So let's deal with that first. That's what you... I do not like the way this is happening. Let's draw a real arrow here. We have silver oxide. But yeah, and my program doesn't like silver oxide because it doesn't recognize that as an element. Right, if silver oxide adding to water, and these things react to form two equivalents of silver hydroxide. And now we have a base. Right. So, so we do are going to have hydroxide anions present here to act as our base. But there is another benefit of using silver that we need to talk about. Silver. Plus, minus. Right? And you might remember from general chemistry or an introductory chemistry course, you might remember these solubility rules. Right? And you might have been asked to memorize them, and you might have been like, what am I ever going to use this for? Well, here, here is an application of those solubility rules. Silver iodide is incredibly insoluble in water with a, a solubility product constant in like the 10 to the, the negative 30s or 40s. And so silver cations are often used in organic chemistry, and you need to strip halide ions out of things. And this is a really good example. So we're stripping the halide out of this uh, system so that it converts the ionic compound initially from the quaternary ammonium iodide to the quaternary ammonium hydroxide. And then it's that hydroxide anion that does the E2 uh, elimination. Right. And so here's the simplified mechanism. And again, if you've studied the E2 elimination, then you know that this is a mechanism that requires a certain geometric uh, arrangement of atoms in leading to, to the most stable transition state. Right, and we're going to end up talking about that in a moment. Right. So here, this is this is chemically what's happening in, in, in terms of enabling the reaction to proceed. Let's talk about regioselectivity. Come down over here. Grab this thing. And so in order to understand regioselectivity, we need to understand the, or we need to draw that three-dimensional structure, which means we need to set the hydrogen atom being deprotonated and the leaving group that's leaving in that anti-periplanar geometry, which means we need to draw Newman projection. Uh, and I'm going to cheat a little bit. These take a lot of time in, in my software, and I've pre-drawn them. Okay. And so there are two Newman projections that we need to consider. Right. We need to look down this carbon carbon bond from carbon 2 to carbon 3. Here is that Newman projection. And it's important to note that this Newman projection is the one that leads to the Zaitsev, or more uh, substituted product. If you, you know, we're looking down the bond where the, we're looking down the bond where the pi bond is going to form, our hydroxide anion it comes and moves this hydrogen and then we get the, the formation of the pi bond in this carbon-carbon bond and the loss of the leaving group. There, all in that anti-periplanar geometry. Okay. The Newman projection for 
the Hoffman product looks like this. All right, and now we're looking down the bond between carbon 1 and carbon 2. All right, so that's where our pi bond is going to form. And again, I can draw uh, the same mechanism arrows. We, we have that anti-periplanar arrangement. Hydroxide. Formation of the pi bond. Loss of leaving group. Now, here is an important thing. Look at these two Newman projections. And I'm actually, I'm actually going to go through and I'm going to delete the mechanism arrows so that we can focus on the Newman projections. Right? And again, if you are following along through a typical organic chemistry sequence, you might have not drawn or looked at a Newman projection for a while. I need to draw something in here for you. Draw these little arcs in here. Where I have drawn those Where I have drawn those uh, lines, there is a gauche interaction between the quaternary ammonium leaving group and this ethyl group, or the, whatever the rest of the chain is. Right. That gauche interaction is creating steric strain in this transition state. In the transition state, or in, in the Newman projection for the other conformation, we don't have any gauche interactions. The the you know the flexible part of this molecule can be bending any way it wants because it's not the carbon we're looking at. Okay. Right, which means there are no steric strain in this particular um, geometry. Okay. So that means that. This geometry over here on the left represents the lower energy transition state, or, or resembles the lower energy transition state of the reaction. The uh, conformation over on the right represents a high energy transition state. And so, under these conditions, that means that the Hoffman product is the kinetic product. And the reality is, is the Hoffman product is always the kinetic product of these um, kinds of reactions. Um, and the Zaitsev product is almost always the thermodynamic product. But in this case, our leaving group, in some cases our leaving group is really small. And so the, the temperature needed to differentiate between kinetic and thermodynamic is really low. But um, here, our leaving group is a big, bulky thing. Okay? So, you know, we're achieving that, that Hoffman selectivity with a big, bulky thing, but it's not the base we're using this time, it's the leaving group. Okay? So, here is our, our explanation for how this uh, Hoffman elimination works. And again, there's a big, bulky group. It's leading towards the Unsub the less substituted product being the kinetic product has the more the lower energy transition state. The the Zaitsev product, the more substituted product, is always the thermodynamic product, which means that there is a temperature above which you can convert this Hoffman elimination into a, a more traditional Zaitsev elimination. But that temperature is pretty high, and so under under room temperature type conditions, you're going to get the the Hoffman product is the major product. So we've been through a lot, um, but I've walked you through how the reaction works, and I've walked you through the origins of the Regio selectivity. Thank you for watching.